The violence in our region is something that we're reminded of daily. I got to bury my nephew. This is about as serious as it gets. If we don't have a suspect developed within one week's time, I start to get nervous. But as much as we see the damage and feel the pain of loss in our communities, she always stayed in contact. It was a real rough time. There are people who are forced to live with that pain on a level that most of us just can't understand. It's like someone ripped every one of my organs out. You just get this feeling, something's not right. Losing a loved one to violence is devastating, but knowing that the person who did it is still out there victimizes families over and over again. It doesn't change any of the facts. It doesn't bring Angelo back. I pray for the closure for his family. So why are there so many unsolved murders? But there's more than 4,000 cases. I mean, where do, where do you start when you're looking at that many? 4,445 to be exact. What can we do to help? And what's the role of police to help these families find closure? A case can run relatively cold within four or five months. Our greatest challenge at the present time is the cooperation of potential eyewitnesses. Everything leads us to a dead end. Yeah. We can't get no answers, and it seems like my son's just another number. These are people that, so the people that did this are nobody, but to us, she was like, the, she was the baby of our, of our family. This is SOS Unsolved Cases. As reporters, we are often on scene covering violence in the moments after it unfolded. But behind every crime scene, there is a grieving family, heartbroken friends, neighbors, co-workers, communities impacted forever. I'm Kelly Rule. Those families have led us into their homes and shared their stories with us. And often we hear a recurring plea for help from them. When weeks, months, years later, they are still looking for answers. So for the next 30 minutes, we're going to continue our commitment to try and find some. I kept telling them my whole entire world is missing and I need you guys to help me find it. Francesca Alvarado, known as Cheka, in many ways started a brand new chapter at age 22, a devoted single mom to her young daughter in Philadelphia, planning to take criminal justice classes at a local community college. Finding her way after the death of her own mom at only age nine with the help of her two sisters. We just don't think these things. Like Tina, who took more of a motherly role, and Francis, the closest to her in age. Her spirit was so bright. She was so beautiful. Like in the pictures, when you see her smiling, that's who she really was. She really, you really couldn't make her mad. She's beautiful. Francesca had no idea of her own beauty. She was just so naive and humble. They talked just about every day, so it did not take long for Francesca's sisters to quickly realize in the days after St. Patrick's Day, March of 2012, something was very wrong. Francesca's sisters say that day she secured a babysitter for her then three-year-old and went to Atlantic City with an older man, an acquaintance. They didn't hear from her. Francis went to check on her at her home in Hunting Park. And her roommate answered, um, and that's when I asked her where was Francesca, and she said, she went to Atlantic City, she'll be back in two weeks. And I thought that was odd because Francesca would have told me that she was going away for two weeks, or she would have at least told Tina that she was going away. She always stayed in contact, like, you know, her daughter was away for the weekend. There was no way she would have left her daughter. And that's when I knew, you just get this feeling, something's not right. Francis said they filed a missing persons report and jumped into action. We started having peace rallies. We started hosting events. We started giving out flyers. We handed out thousands of flyers. We sent them to shelters, sent them to hospitals all across the U.S. We, we explored every single option. But it still wasn't real. Francesca was last seen by the Borgata. She did not have her phone on her, either lost or broken at the time, so she took her laptop. Her sisters say that was never found. They did everything they could for 18 months. And then in August 2013, roughly 26 miles away, they say a fisherman at Corson's Inlet in Ocean City found a foot fully intact inside an Adidas high-top sneaker. 
And as soon as we saw that sneaker, I couldn't stand those sneakers. I hated those sneakers. I told her they were so ugly. So as soon as we saw it, we knew that was Francesca. I just couldn't accept that reality. So I said, you know, she knew I hated those sneakers. She threw it in the water because she wanted me to find her. She's fighting. She wants us to keep fighting. I was so in denial. Somehow her sisters found the strength to jump into action again, repeatedly searching human remains found, bones found on the internet. And that's how they found out Francesca's femur and tibia also washed ashore. And we had to go down the rundown, call the medical examiner. Hey, we're from Philly. Our sister's from Philly. You guys found a bone. Can you please run it with my sister's DNA? And it, six weeks later, we got a confirmation. And it's just frustrating how we had to find my sister. There were no authorities that found her. There was no search crew. No one searched the water. They all fell on. She left willingly, so she will return willingly. It's a pain that never goes away. It stays with you for the rest of your life. People say it gets better when it gets, no, it doesn't. It never gets better. It doesn't get old. It's almost like you're reliving it again and again, especially when you don't get to, to find somebody to bury the hole. You know what I mean? Francesca's family never got a cause of death and didn't find any more of her. They chose to finally lay her recovered bones to rest on top of her mother in April 2016 at Green Mountain Cemetery. Francesca's daughter is now 13 years old, and 10 years later, there's no known person of interest, no arrests, no answers. If Francesca was never this complicated, so why is it so complicated to solve this, like, you know, this mystery? We called, we would go there, we would talk to different people, they couldn't tell us nothing, and even 10 years now, I don't expect them to tell us anything. But what I do always pray for is that the somebody who knows what happened would at least just tell us something. Her family says police questioned her roommate and the man she went to Atlantic City with. They're exhausted, but not defeated. Our soul still wants to search for her. We still Google bones, remains found, washed ashore. We're still searching for her. And then I think that's a lot of people when it comes to missing people, you just never stop searching for the person. an alarming number of children to the city's gun violence epidemic. In the thick of the COVID-19 pandemic, that was a huge fear for so many, including grade school coaches who were deeply worried about children not having in-person schooling and after-school athletics and activities. In July 2020, the Frankfurt High School football team lost 15-year-old Angelo Walker. His case still unsolved. We were unable to get in touch with his family who have since moved out of the city, but his football coach, Bill Seitzma, lives with his and others' loss every day. Transitioning from the field to the sidelines, Bill Seitzma says football is still his passion. No matter what, the fact is we have to have programs and activities for our kids. One that's brought a lot of purpose as he transitioned from player to coach, and in recent years, unexpected pain. It's a little over two years and it's still difficult to think about. Before COVID-19 as head coach of the Frankfurt High School football team, Coach Seitzma lost two players. When the pandemic hit in March of 2020, schools closed for in-person learning and after-school activities, including athletics, canceled. No outlet, no safe space. A huge worry for Coach Seitzma that only continued into the summer. You know, the summer before we did a game night, so on Friday nights where we had the players come in just so they could be off the streets. So definitely when schools and activities were shut down at that point, it was a, it was a big worry. And sure enough, I still remember that July night, you know, getting that text message. That, um, that he was shot. His 15-year-old sophomore player, Angelo Walker, was shot and killed July 5th while riding his bicycle, according to Philadelphia police. It happened just before 8.30 p.m. on Nassau Road. Two other men, 36 and 35 years old, were also wounded in the shooting. No kid deserved to die. Seitzma says he met with Angelo and his mom just a few months before, right before COVID-19 closed schools. And we were talking about, you know, he really wanted to try to make football work. And we were discussing a plan, like what he needed to do academically, athletically, how to train, just how young, full of life he was. You know, he's a, 
he's a vibrant kid and, and you know just it's really tough to when you see something like that happen and what it does to his family what it does to your team what it does to everybody involved the team did finally have a season the following spring and made a memorial for Angelo that they kept on the sideline. Organizations like the Earths Foundation reached out to help. It was a big effort to really get us through that year. Like getting through that spring football season was really, really, really tough. It just, it just didn't feel right. Like it really did. Seitzma took a step back from coaching and joined Open Door Abuse Awareness and Prevention, or ODAP's Board of Directors, another organization that helped his team in the weeks after Angelo's murder. Seitzma became vocal about safely getting kids back in sports in the midst of a pandemic. Action to move forward, but when it came to Angelo, time stood still. Two years later, no arrests. When will we know the, you know, the full story of what happened and uh, why, why Angelo lost his life? We have, we have this culture where in the streets and that, you know, you can't come forward. That if you know something, you have to bottle it up. But, I mean, on the other part of that, you have people who are grieving. You have families who are grieving, and it's, it's really not fair. That culture is something Seitzman talks with his players about. He doesn't know how an arrest would make him feel. Kids lost a friend, they lost a brother. They but he knows Angelo and his family deserve it. It doesn't change any of the facts. Um, it doesn't bring Angelo back. Um, I pray for the closure for his family. I know his family really struggled uh, with this. And um, so if it brings them closure, I really hope they find resolution in, in this case and find whoever's responsible for his murder. When a loved one is taken as a result of violence, there are always so many questions. And that's the case with Charles Chucky Maud. His family describes him as a well-liked father, but with no answers in his murder, his family lives on memories and the hope for closure. I'm empty. Charles, Chucky, Maud's family members take a piece of him everywhere they go. Memories fill their home in pictures and letters to heaven from little hands, their yard, their cars. He'll never be forgotten. His father, mom, and stepmother on a mission. He loved his daughters more than anything in this world. Everybody he loved. He never had a problem with anybody. He had the kindest heart in the world, so I don't know who would take his life, I guess, for no reason. That's all I have left is hope. I have to have hope. I'm hopeful because I know that there's somebody out there that knows exactly what happened. This is the last video of Chucky with one of his two daughters, six-year-old Isabel. Who's the best dad? On Friday, March 12th, 2021, Chucky dropped her off at his mom's house in Port Richmond. I gave him a hug and he left and he went down to Emerald Street. About two hours later, Philadelphia police say they found Chucky shot inside of his black 2002 Mercedes Benz in the area of 3200 Emerald Street, just after 10.45 p.m. They rushed him to Temple University Hospital, but he didn't survive. I don't even know how to explain it. It's like someone ripped every one of my organs out. Like I just felt so empty. And again, I went straight back into denial. I was like, there's no way. He wouldn't leave us. There's no way. We'll never get to give my son a hug again. Like, I can't wish him a birthday or a Merry Christmas. Like, they, they robbed us of that. Police released surveillance video of the two men they are looking for. Chucky's family believes he was either listening to music or accidentally fell asleep in his car at the time of the shooting. In the video, you see two men approach his car. The one guy tried to shoot and his gun, his gun got jammed. So then the other guy shot. He started walking away, and the, uh, the second guy stood there and tried to shoot again, but his gun wouldn't go off. Police believe the men were in this white four-door sedan with a vanity-type plate with red marking on the front of the car, last seen heading southbound on Kensington from Allegheny. Chucky was well-known in the area from growing up in his mother's Port Richmond home. He would babysit people's kids so they could go to work. 
He was always out there sweeping the block. He liked helping people. Anybody we ask, like, did Chucky have a problem with anybody? Did he, did he have an argument, did anything? And everybody was like, no. Chucky was Chucky, like everybody loved Chucky. Dean and Jennifer, who say they had not seen eye to eye in the past, became united in their quest for answers. She would call me, I would call her. I, she would be upset. I would bring her up, like, you can't do this, we gotta keep on fighting, we're not gonna stop. He would be happy about that, he would. Cause he, he loved us both, like very much. So I know he'd be happy. Chucky's family says they have scoured social media, talked to eyewitnesses, questioned everyone they knew, and passed everything along to police. They put up an additional $30,000 reward in addition to the city's $20,000 reward. They held their second annual memorial to raise money for his daughter's futures. And still nothing. 50000 could start your life over. Chucky's family says he may have witnessed an incident between a man and woman earlier in the night and verbally intervened. They believe someone knows something. He didn't just ruin our lives. He ruined her, our whole family, whoever did this. And you can't grieve, you can't move on. I feel like I'm stuck that night, still, over a year later. I still feel like I'm stuck in that same night. And I don't feel like I'm ever gonna move until the people that did it are arrested. In Philadelphia alone, there are more than 4,000 active cold cases dating back to 1990. Often when cases remain unsolved, there is a belief that investigators have simply moved on. But we found out that's rarely the case. Sometimes it just comes down to resources. The Philadelphia Police Department is now reforming a cold case unit, an attempt to bring closure to some of these grieving families. At the Philadelphia Police Department's headquarters, boxes and boxes of files stacked in a closet. These are the homicide cases dating back to only 2019. That year, there were 353 homicides. 2020, they jumped to 499. Last year, 562. It was very unfortunate, but the, the cold cases ended up going by the wayside. Historically, the police department's cold case unit was a part of the special investigations unit. Homicide Captain Jason Smith says he was forced to begin assigning that unit to active homicides as they came in to keep up with the surge. But family members of loved ones with no answers also continued to call. We will continue to work those investigations, but in order to do that effectively, I need a team of investigators. Captain Smith says he's reforming the cold case unit. Currently, two teams and four total investigators. By mid-September, he will have eight focused solely on cold cases. It's where the assigned investigator has just begun to run out of, out of leads on that investigation. Captain Smith says his investigators will operate off of tips and pulling old case files to meticulously go through them, identifying all former witnesses, but the biggest emphasis will be on DNA. It could be, you know, blood from from the perpetrator. Yes, we're we're finding that 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 evidence can be retested, and we can develop a suspect based off of that DNA profile. He says technology continues to improve. Now, forensic experts can even recover DNA from ballistic evidence. He thinks that will be a game changer. I have homicide investigators. They receive weekly phone calls from the mothers of homicide victims. Weekly. The mothers aren't giving up. Why should we? The sheer number of unsolved cases in our area are staggering, but we can't lose hope. We will continue to share your stories and work with investigators so families know their loved ones are not forgotten. I'm Kelly Rule. If you have any information that you would like to share or stories to tell, reach out to me and we will continue to broadcast them. Thank you so much to everyone who participated in the show, and we'll see you again soon.